Welcome to Voices of Value. Today, we shine a spotlight on Glenn and Gina, the driving force behind Full Throttle Fitness and the Full Throttle Foundation. A beacon of athlete and character development in underserved neighborhoods with a collective legacy of over three decades, they're not just shaping bodies, they're shaping futures. Through personalized training and a nurturing environment, they're sculpting champions both in and out of the ring. At Full Throttle Fitness, it's not just about lifting weights. It's not just about fighting in the ring. It's not just about sweating. It's about lifting spirits and building resilience. Join Glenn and Gina on this transformative journey where the pursuit of excellence meets the power of community. gym I was still a nurse in the medical field for 15 years prior. I was a little nervous taking on a business but I was super excited um, because I like to help people. I'm a mom of four and I love kids and my two older boys actually fought from another gym so I was always attending their fights. That's really all the flexing like, experience that I've had but I'm really into it now and I give a lot of advice and uh, I'm a certified nutritionist so I help a lot with the kids and what they can and can't eat. I hope to keep growing and expand into a new space. I've started an LLC for a juicing business that I want to collaborate with the gym for the kids. I just want to keep growing and expanding and just reaching out to more people in the community. Let them know that we're here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is your boy, C I double Z Y. Or you may know me as Collis, C-O-L-L-I-S. You know, I got to make sure I spell it for the people so they can easily uh, work on their pronunciation so they're not calling me Carlos. We're back at it again with another episode of Voices of Value. We're going around the city of Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and talking to influential entrepreneurs and business owners who are trying to create impact in the community. And today, we're back at it again with another fire guest I've yet to lie to you yet. With that being said, go ahead and introduce yourself, Glenn. Glenn Cusimano from Full Throttle Fitness and Full Throttle Foundation. I love it. And Glenn, I need you to say your last name for me one more time because I was trying to decide how I was going to try to say it, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to let him do it and then I'm going to double yeah, down. A lot it. of people, I get that a lot. So it's Cusimano. Cusimano. That's the okay. last name. So. Uh, that's what I was about to ask. I was like, yeah, that's yeah. giving very Italian. So yeah. before we dive into the business, can we dive into a little bit of your background? Uh, how's the, uh, what's the, the ethnic background? How the Italian last name? Or are you from Kansas City? Where were you raised? Let's jump into all of that. Okay. Uh, so my mom is Sicilian. My dad was black. Um, and uh, really from the inner city, uh, basically both of them. Uh, my dad went to Central High School. Okay. So, so Kansas City. Um, Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but I honestly uh, gravitated more to my mother's side yeah. of the family just because yeah. my dad was a different individual. Yeah, uh, you know, coming from the inner city, uh, involved in a lot of different things. Uh, and so I, you know, I was exposed to a lot of that as a young kid. So, um, which is a lot of the reason why I do what I do now with our foundation. So, and I'll, I'll get into that, but, um, yeah, inner city, I went to central high school also played football, um, graduated from central. And then I went to the air force for two years and took an early out because I realized pretty quick that that was not for me <laughs> and uh, came home and uh, started my fitness journey, so to speak. So I love it. I love it. There's a lot of dogs <clears throat> out of Central High School, especially specific to football. Yeah. A lot yeah. of dogs. You guys yeah, have some I, good seasons. I loved football. I played football there yeah. and I loved the game. Um, well, I took that back. I loved hitting people because mm. mm. I had a lot of aggression yeah. and anger yeah, as a tough. young kid. So, yeah. um I didn't really love the game. The one thing I, I uh, upset me the most is I could be on the field and give 110% and do everything that I was supposed to do. But if somebody else did something wrong, we could lose the game. Mm, mm. I didn't like that, mm. which is why I started boxing. Right? Yeah. Because you get in the ring, there's nobody else to blame but you. I love that. I love that. That's actually, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Ray Lewis. And I used to listen to this podcast he did, um, you know, early 2018s, 2019s. One thing he said, he was like, you know, on every big play, it comes down to one person deciding not to do their job. Mm -hmm. 
It is like, are you going to be that one person? Facts, man. And for, it sounds very simple. It doesn't even sound motivating when I said it like that. But like coming out of Ray Lewis' voice, you start to double think things when, when somebody with a powerful uh, voice man. like that says, so you start thinking about it. You're like, there's yeah. no lie there. And that's like, it's, it's, a, it's a tough line to walk when you're trying to be a family, when you're trying to be a team, but you understand that somebody is – Somebody made a decision to not do their job on yeah. that play. And how are you going to take that up as a, as a young man? <laughs> not a man yeah. yet, but as yeah. a young man. When you when you play a game um, that is that dependent on on other people, right? Mm-hmm. It, you have to have that mentality that everybody has to do their job and everybody has to know what they're doing. Because like you said, all it takes is one person. You know, one of my favorite athletes ever. Um, and I, I was just listening to some stuff from him this morning. It's Kobe Bryant. Rest in peace. Rest but, in peace. you know, he talked about, you know, people would talk about how selfish he was in the beginning, you know, because he, he always, he didn't pass the bar. He took that last shot. But his mentality was, I saw you come into practice late and leave early. I was there an hour before you and an hour after. So why am I going to pass you the ball? Mm-hmm. I can't depend on you. Can't depend on you. Yeah. Right? I know how much time I've put in. Mm. And so that was my mentality. You know, I get in the ring, and I know that I have put in the work. I know what I have done. So my confidence level is is there because at that point, I'm not asking myself to do something that I haven't done a thousand times already, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, rolling underneath, missing a punch, slipping a punch, combinations, I've done them repeated, repeatedly over and over and over and over. So I'm prepared. I love you know? it. So that to me is what I love about the sport. I love it. What's one of your favorite things about being Sicilian? Like what's one aspect of your mother's background and culture that you really just appreciate from the, I know a lot of people understand the strong familial aspect of that culture, but could it be that with food? Is it I certain? I right yeah. the food. No. Yeah. I mean, we used to have these really big gatherings, uh, you know, the food, obviously the lasagna, the, the meatballs, you know, manicotti. I mean, you know, all different kinds of dishes. I have yet to make it to Italy. Um, but I've been, you know, telling my wife here, we're gonna go soon. So, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, man, the food. This, you know, this the um, the family feeling. Um, and I think, as from a young age, um, understanding loyalty, mm. right? You know, yes, you gotta understand uh, being Sicilian and coming from a background of my family. My great grandmother was cousin to the Gambino crime family. Right. So loyalty is a serious thing. Yeah. So I was I was introduced to a lot of things that a kid probably shouldn't be introduced to at a very young age. Um, just being around certain uncles and hearing them talk and um and the way they live their lives. Um my my grandmother, when I was ten years old, took me to see the movie Scarface when I was ten <laughs> when it came out, right? So like that was the kind of upbringing mm-hmm. I had that I was yeah. exposed to. So, and not that it was bad, you know, by any means. Uh, so there's learnings that come in with yeah, that. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So I, I loved every bit of it, though, man. I yeah, and I just like a quick touch on that. I think mm-hmm. like exposure to certain content or experiences for children isn't necessarily bad as long as the the, the person that is exposing them to that is adding in an educational aspect to it and like sharing like yeah. you know this is this is you see this character trait that you saw in this this movie mm-hmm. sure it was shown in a certain way but i want you to focus on this aspect or like i say that to say there's plenty of young kids i grew up with who were allowed to watch whatever they want and to be honest they were smart as hell. Like before everyone else, they were exposed to a lot more, not strictly from the movies, but just because their parents were allowing them into adult conversations yeah. or adult situations, they understood what was going on before a lot of the other young bulls did. So the street smart aspect. Yeah, exactly. Right? And yeah. I think that's so, important. It's very important. As long as it's harnessed in the correct way, which it all comes down to the family, right? So I agree. Um, you know, I want to talk about Full Throttle Fitness Foundation. You know, when I you Googled you guys. The first thing that came up was the foundation. I was like, okay, well, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for fitness. I was looking for sweating. Yeah. So what's the foundation about? Talk about the beginnings of the Full Throttle Foundation. Okay. So um, initially we uh, we had Full Throttle Fitness, obviously, um, and Full Throttle Fitness was based around um, hit classes, adult fitness classes, but also sports performance training for youth. I've been doing sports performance training for youth uh about 20 years. Oh, it doesn't look like it, but I'm, I'm up there. Back when I was seven. Yeah. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Yeah. So, 
uh, and I've always uh, loved being able to work with kids and helping them get from, you know, one level to the next level, whatever that is. Because we've worked with with um, athletes of all different ages from middle school to high school, um, high school to, to college, and then college to the pros. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've trained a couple guys that went to the NFL, stuff like that. So we've been at every level. The one thing that really bothered me, though, was that um, – Sports performance training has become such a, a, a market, right, and, and commercialized to where, I mean, it's a big money maker, you know. And so the kids that are in low-income areas or underserved areas, they, they don't get that. They're not exposed to it because they can't afford it, which means they get left behind. You know, there's no scholarships for them. There's no, you know. And unfortunately, very rarely do you see those kids get an academic scholarship, right? right? Yeah. And so – <clears throat> our job, or excuse me, our thought process was to be able to bring those kids in at a very low income or a very low price point, uh, if not for free, and then um, help them get to college through sports, right? Mm-hmm. Through whatever that is, whatever sport that is. And so we started doing that. And then, of course, in doing that, our, our at the time, our bulk of clientele for uh, Full Throttle Fitness were more functional fitness or CrossFit um, mm-hmm. clients. Yeah, CrossFit clients are a little different, right? They they like to be camaraderie and they Don't like get to, me started on it. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and uh, which is okay. Yeah, but the more kids I brought in, the more they kind of kind of went to another gym. They didn't yeah. really want, you know, they kind of went in the environment. They were looking so, for. yeah, which was fine. But the 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 bad part about that was that that was our income, mm. right? So. um so the more of them went away and the more kids I was bringing in for free, my wife was like, Hey, um, <laughs> we got to do something here. You know, <laughs> like this ain't working out, babe. And so, uh, but I had already started with a few kids and quite a few kids. And, uh, I'm not at the point where I'm just going to tell them, no, like I can't do this anymore. So yeah. I was talking to a friend. Uh, he said, man, you need to start a nonprofit mm-hmm. try to raise some money to, you know, help, Supplement support that. this situation. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what we did. We started uh, Full Throttle Foundation. Um, it's been an, uh, actually we were we got our IRS determination letter in January of twenty three. Congratulations! So a little over a year now we've been going, and uh, you know it's been a struggle for sure. Yeah. You know, especially financially, um, because a lot of times when you're in your first year, a lot of companies, corporations, stuff like that, they don't really want to support you because they don't know how long you're going to be around. Mm-hmm. And then for some odd reasons, a lot of places have have kind of veered away from supporting anything that deals with sports, you know. Uh, but ours is much different because I've, we've taken the angle of um, we are we are more of a community development type nonprofit because um, we have a guy that comes in and talks to the kids about drug prevention. We've got a tutoring component where, you know, if they want to keep their grades up, obviously, because the goal is to try and help them get to college, right? Absolutely. So we've got a financial guy on our board um, that is able to talk to the kids about financial literacy. You know, we, we had some one of our, our guys that ended up going on to the NFL, and then we found out he didn't know how to write a check. Mm-hmm. You know, so those are things that you try to figure out, man, how did that get missed? Yeah. Right? You know, but it happens, right? So um, my wife um, has gotten about – 20 certifications in the last three years. She was in the medical field for 15 years. Yeah. And she came over once we started doing this to really try to, you know, help out full time. So, and it's been a job for her, but she's been amazing, man. Just, uh, she's gotten her personal training certification, nutrition certification, yoga instructor. And I think there's, there's two more that I'm missing. I can't think of right now, but all within the last like year and a half. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, she really talks to the kids a lot about nutrition. She started her own um, juicing company called Juice by G, where we I do like it. the fresh press juices for the kids. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's been a full service for us, you know. But the goal, like I said before, is really to try to help these kids get to college. We know all of them aren't going to get to college. But at the same time, maybe all of a sudden now they think, well, you know what? I can go to trade school mm-hmm. or I can go, you know, I can I go on my own business. I can start yeah, my own business. Because you provided them with the framework to start thinking about <clears> that and the – the the foundational what is it uh, mindset beliefs understandings around finances around how to carry yourself as a young man or woman and all of these things carry over to not just sports although the goal may be to get them to college a lot of those same characteristics are also going to get them their first job are also going to get them their you know maybe build a nice relationship with a partner that helps them get somewhere 
help them think about different businesses to start. Right. And now they're exposed to all these leaders that you're bringing into this space. Another opportunity for them to, you know, figure out different career paths. Oh, that guy talked to me about finances. Maybe I'm going to be a financial advisor. I loved what he taught me or she taught me. So yeah, exactly. I love that. Exactly. And you kind of answered my my next question within what you just shared. But if you would like to dive into it a little bit deeper, I wanted to talk to you about what exactly the education, the inspire and the protection aspect of the fitness foundation or full throttle fitness foundation Mm -hmm. brand and what you mean by that. So from an education perspective, you definitely just covered that in terms of the certifications your wife's got and how she's trying to help from a nutrition perspective. Um, Also, I know within yoga, there's a lot of meditation aspect and mindset. So I'm sure she helps with that. You talked about financial advisors, uh, motivational speakers, Mm -hmm. ex athletes or ex, you know, professional athletes or Mm -hmm. current professional athletes. So understand the education aspect how do you think about the inspire and protection aspect specifically the protection aspect uh so the protection aspect for me comes from uh a, a couple different um components so we have a lot of kids that uh like we we, we work with some kids and we just started we just started um put together a summer program um actually just gonna st- one in may for heartland 180 which is another nonprofit organization yeah, yeah. and these kids are kids that are in the system, trouble kids that um, either adoption system or mm-hmm. so um, a lot, a lot of times, obviously these kids have issues coming from different trouble backgrounds. And so what we try to do is um, get them in here, get them to open up, right? We don't just talk about sports. We don't just talk about fitness, right? We have a conversation about, and my wife is great with that to try to get the kids to open up. Um, they immediately have a connection with us. And then from there, they start to tell us about things that are going on with them, mm. right? Uh, I'll give you a prime example with another kid that we worked with, with um, Low Riding to Success, Mr. Mm-hmm. Cervantes. Yeah. Amazing man, amazing man. Um, he has a, a very similar program. You know, he gets some ex-gang members in, and they, they build these bicycles, and it's obviously a very cool thing. But um, I have about three or four kids from his group that also come here to work out with us. And one of the kids in particular – we were here, me and my wife was here one day, and he showed up, and he's like, it's okay if I'm here? Daniel was his name. I'm like, yeah, what's going on, man? You okay? You know? Yeah, I was just, you know, just got into it with my mom, and I seen his mom kind of drive off fast. You know, I'm like, what's going on? What's wrong? You know? You know, I don't know. I, and he starts telling me, and so I start kind of talking to him. I'm, okay, what did you do to cause this problem? Let's not blame everything on mom. You know, and so we talk, and, then, you know, after we talk, he's like, man, I'm so glad I came here because I was just going to go get high at first. So, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, having a positive place for these kids to come and be able to talk and express themselves and and not feel like they're going to be judged, right, or not feel like somebody's going to come down on them um, is obviously, for me, a, a very clear way to, 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 to provide protection for them. You 100%. know what I mean? To provide a comfort zone for them to where they can come and and feel like, you know, they can just – say what they got to say, let it off their chest and, and be protected by it. So the true definition of intervention. So when we think about <clears throat> intervention, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about intervening in a process that leads somewhere potentially negative or potentially positive. So in that moment, this young, this young man made the decision to come here because he knows about you guys. But in order for him to know about you guys, you have to create you know, the, the <laughs> exactly. space. So, you know, I know you mentioned it's early in the process. There's a lot of challenges, but I think what you guys are building here is, is, is a win. If it's 30 years or if it's three years or a hundred years, whatever it is, there's going to be some kids whose lives were saved. And, you know, and if we don't want to take it to that extreme, whose lives were improved, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So I love that. The, the next question I want to ask you is, you know, when I was going through your website, you were talking about, and you kind of just touched on it a little bit before, um, you know, the, the, the adult fitness, the cross the aspect, being an OP and, and trying to make a decision when you were thinking about what's next. It's like, all right, we can either go up North this way yeah. or we can stay right here. And maybe this isn't the question you guys were deciding, but this is how I processed it while reading that. It's like, all right, it's community or profits. And, exactly. And I love that you guys made the decision to go with community, of course. My challenge question is, is there a way to do both how or why or why not? Like, how do you think about that? Like, to have both the profits of building a business, building a successful business, being able to feed yourself and your family and reinvest back in the community, 
but then also being there for the community. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> that's exactly the process that we went through. The thought process literally was like, dude, cause I have a lot of clients that are personal training clients that are in mission Hills and Prairie village. Mm-hmm. Obviously there's a higher income bracket there. Yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> and I've trained some of their kids for sports performance training. So our thought process, well, do we go far to the South where there's more, you know, higher income or opportunity to make more money? And, and quite honestly, we were already kind of like, it's not like we were, you know, making the big bucks at that time. You know, we were kind of borderline making a profit. Uh, and so she found this space and I thought, you know, and I was already working with some kids from KCK mm-hmm. at that point, <clears throat> bringing them in like a, a big group for like $10 a head. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I didn't really want to go away from doing that. And at the same time, I felt like that was something that we could grow on to get to where I was trying to get to with the kids anyway. And so when she found the space, you know, it was three minutes from where we were, I was like, okay, this is perfect. You know? So as far as, you know, trying to come to a point where they coexist and we're actually able to, you know, feed the family, that part has been very tough. Like I said before, um, you know, trying to raise money, we've had a couple of fundraisers and we try, um, obviously through, through donations and things like that. And, but the crazy thing is that like we've reached out to several different entities as far as like the, the KCK um, school board and mm-hmm. all these different things where we thought we could be able to have um, access to more kids. And it's not like we went to them with our hand out, like, Oh, if you pay it, not like we presented our situation and our program and, you know, we're going to try to raise money for it because for me, the way I look at it is if I can go to a credible, you know, uh, organization like, you know, KCK school district or, or Turner high school or, 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 or big brothers, big sisters. Like we, we got some kids coming in from the MMA, which is really good. Um, boys and girls club, anything like that to where we're, we're actually doing something with community where people know of this, you know, organization that it's been around for a long time. And this is what we're supporting then it might be easier for us to, to financially support that situation. Yeah. So I try and go and find that first and then try to find the money mm-hmm. to do it, you know? And if we don't have it, then I try and make it work, yeah. you know, because I'm not going to tell the kids no. Absolutely. So it's been hard. It's been hard, especially with uh, the school district, uh, simply because everybody says, oh, yeah, I love what you're doing. It's a great idea. But then we find out, well, I'm going to give you to this person. And this person says, well, I'm going to give you to this person. I'm and it keeps on going. And then there's well, 17 emails no, interchanged like, for a year. And then yeah. they wanted us to fill out this peach jar thing or something where we submit flyers to all the schools. Mm-hmm. They cost me $1,000 to do it. And I was like, oh, we're providing a free service. I didn't ask you guys for any money. Mm-hmm. So I'm just trying to help the kids. Yeah. But you want me to pay money to do that? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So just stuff like that, man, has been has been kind of insane. But um, we just keep pushing, man. We keep pushing. You know, I, I keep trying to get the word out there as much as possible. You know, I think we're headed in the right direction, especially with organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'm really happy that, you know, I was asked to speak on um, Black Leadership Panel for kids last last month, a couple few weeks ago for them, and uh, got to interact with a lot of different kids and um, expose them to what we're doing. So... I'm real excited about that. So, you know, I I think in the long run it, it's gonna it's gonna come together and it's gonna 100%. work out. And 100%. yeah, we just we just keep treading right now. Keep until, believing. Keep showing up until we get there. That's 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 it. And you know, I think everyone knows both with what you're trying to do, but then also on the flip side, from like a strictly entrepreneurship perspective, this shit is hard. <laughs> yeah. And 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 with that being said, is there <clears throat> any one any quote any podcast? Uh, Anything that you rely on to keep your brain in the right headspace when you're going through these ups and downs, obviously you have a beautiful, awesome wife by your side supporting you yeah. with this part, and that's extremely essential and yeah. important in this process. I'm sure you're going to start there, but outside of that, is there anything else that you really tap into for that source of energy to keep showing up? Yeah, first and foremost, it's always my wife. She's she's my number one supporter. She's my number one, you know, she's always there, uh, Definitely gives me balance for sure, you know, because sometimes I'm like, I, I, 
I get to a point where I'm ready to cuss somebody out about mm-hmm. something. She's like, whoa, 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 you know, so. Um, but beyond that, uh, I think for me, it's, I come from a, a background of, um, of kind of rolling with the punches, so to speak. Yeah. You know, uh, like I said before, I've been through some some hardships, you know, at an early age, just going through different things. Um, and my mom was a person that uh, I was able to look to at a young age and and understand work ethic and, and what it takes, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. to to support your family and, and, uh, and provide. So, you know, uh, my, my parents kind of instilled that in me, my mom and my stepdad at a very young age. And so there hasn't been much that like has happened to me where I've been like, Oh, I'm not gonna make it. You know what I mean? Um, which I could see, you know, other people would probably fold and I just continue to keep going. And and I've said this before, you know, I, I said it earlier, um, Kobe Bryant, you know, one of my uh, greatest heroes as far as um, putting a, a forth an example of of what work ethic means and and to continue to push and to continue to go um, and continue to fight, you know, no matter what the obstacle is. And so that's that's always kind of where my head has been at, and that's just the way I operate. I love it. I love it. So obviously you fought growing growing up. Obviously, we have a ring behind us. Obviously, you work with a lot of fighters in the area. You know, for those who out, those out there who challenge the sport of fighting, like why oh, it's violent or why should my kid be involved in that or it promotes this or it promotes that, what do you have to say to people who aren't, and maybe it's nothing, but <laughs> what yeah. do you have to say to people who are like, there's no value in the sport of boxing or is there, it's going to teach them violence or it's going to teach them this what what did fighting teach you and what have you seen it teach other youth and how have other people used it as an outlet to create good in the world yeah so first off uh i've never looked at boxing as um just being violent Mm -hmm. um and i think maybe that's because i you know i took a a liking to it and loved it you know from the get-go at a very young age muhammad ali was one of my heroes also Mm -hmm. um being very young. So uh, I I think the character and, uh, you know, the, the, the hardships that, that, that a person has to go through. Boxing is a very lonely sport, right? Like when you're training and, and you're putting yourself through uh, the mental grind and the physical grind of what it takes, normally it's, it's, alone right like it's it's not with uh, a whole team Uh, I mean don't get me wrong there's a lot of boxers in here that are doing the same thing but they're not really to get they're not they're not on the same they're not working out together right there there's they're they're doing the same workout but um you don't have somebody standing next to you going let's go let's go you know pushing you 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 push yourself you know what I mean and so if you don't have that you know, mental toughness and mental drive uh, to be able to push yourself to the next level, um, you're not going to make it. But, but the I, I think the one thing that you learn very quickly is um, what kind of person you are, as far as you know, your not just your athleticism, right? Because to me, it's not necessarily about that as much as it is your, your drive. It's always going to be about your drive, you know, and so. Um, I, we have a lot of kids that come in here that you learn, you you find out right off the bat, like what kind of boxer they're going to be. You know, I have an eight year old kid that came in here from day one, man. And he's been boom. You know what I mean? Right after his first couple workouts, you know, he's always going, what's next coach? What's next coach? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you have some kids that come in and they're like, you tell them what to do. And then they, they're off in the corner somewhere. And maybe that's because they're not really into boxing. Yeah. Right. And so you start talking to them and trying to figure out, you know, is this something you really want to do? I kind of want to work out, but then you figure out they're they're not really into athletics, right? Mm-hmm. It's just not. It's just parents kind of brought them here because somebody else's dream. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, as far as the violence part of it, you know, there's so many different things that they do now to protect the, the kids, especially at a young age. You know what I mean? Um, can you get hurt ultimately? You know, once you go professional. Yeah, you can get hurt. 
But you could also get hurt playing football, and you could also get hurt playing baseball. You hit the head with a baseball, like. I know, know. I know someone firsthand that passed away from that. Man. Yeah, man. yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't. I, as a parent, you know, and this obviously, I think, depends on a lot of the parents' upbringing, right, and how they were raised. Yeah. You know, um, if they look at it as something that's just violent, and you know, I. <laughs> I think it would be hard to change their mind. 100%. You know, um, unless they brought their kid in and they started to see their kid getting better and they started to see their kid develop in other areas of life. Mm -hmm. You know, responsibility. They start to get a little more, you know, as far as the way they operate and, and, and do things. I mean, it teaches a kid real quick about what it takes in, in just daily life of like their, their simple routine. Yeah. You know, I t- tell kids all the time, you can't come in the boxing gym and just be perfect and great in here. Like greatness is something that you, it's a lifestyle. Carry with you. Everywhere. Right. Like right. you carry everywhere. So when you go home and you're doing stuff or when you go to school, when you're doing your schoolwork, like you have to have that same mentality, the way you approach every facet in life, not just the boxing gym. I love it. I love right. it. Last question I want to ask <clears throat> you today is, you know, You've lived a, a, a full life, let's imagine, 115 years old, you know, all these different peptides and stuff coming out into the world. We might live a long time. You never yeah. know. Um, so 115 years old, your great, great grandkids are sitting at your feet and they're looking up at you and they're like, great, great grandpa, Glenn, what's one piece of advice on how to live a good life? What are you going to tell them? Mind you, they can't listen to any podcast you ever did. They can't read any of your books. They can't watch any documentary on you. This is the last thing they're going to remind you, remember you for one piece of advice on how to live a good life. Uh, I think one of the most important things that I try to tell every kid, not just my kids, and not just, you know, is that whatever you choose to do in life, um, do it. Mm. And in other words, don't go into it saying, well, I want to do this, but if I don't make it, my backup plan is because to me, you've already made it okay to fail at that. Mm -hmm. So make a commitment to do that. Shake hands with yourself and say, this is what it takes to be able to do that. And don't negotiate with yourself throughout the process. Whether you're trying to be a a world champion, whether you're trying to be, you know, an engineer, a doctor, and you know you have to go through all these steps through school, don't get to the third year and go like, you know, I'm going to take a year off. If you've already given yourself this amount of time to get that degree, finish it. Don't negotiate with yourself. Because as soon as you start doing that, then you start doing it across the board. Mm -hmm. Right? And so... Um, for me, it's always been about you have a goal, you go get it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something, ever. Okay. That to me is is uh, it, it can have a profound impact on a person's life. As long as they embrace it, right? <laughs> yeah, as long as they embrace it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Glenn, I appreciate your time today. Before we sign out, please let the folks know how they can support you. Um, the business, the foundation, and then obviously where they can find this location. So our foundation is on our full throttle foundation.com. Um, we have a link on there. If, you know, somebody wants to try to support you know, monetarily with donations, it'd be great. Or just come up and, you know, check us out. Um, we have started, like I said, our boxing component is full throttle fighters. Um, if you're interested in getting your kids into boxing, we'd love to have them, you know? So, uh, like I said, the biggest thing for us, man, is just trying to have access to as many kids as we can. Um, and help them get to the next level. So that's it. Love it. Love it. Appreciate you. All right, man. Thank you.